Hey, deserving listeners, just me today. I thought I would answer your short questions on Discord, and I just checked the channel there and found that there were many, many questions, probably because I'm answering them on the air and people know that they can actually post questions there. And there are a lot of really great questions. So if you want to submit a question to Discord, you have to sign up with Discord, blah, 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 and there should be a link below or on our website, you can find the link. And uh, if you don't know, Discord's like Slack, but often for gamers. But, you know, it's an interesting venue to meet other people and whatnot. But anyway, so I'm a Kate says, have you ever looked up your clients on Google or social media? Would this be unethical? Sometimes I wonder if my therapist is ever looking at mine. End of question. Yeah, I've looked up my clients on Google uh, occasionally, I would say less than 1% of the time. I'm trying to think of, and I can't remember particular clients that I did this with, but uh, I imagine that if a client was really famous, for example, and I didn't really know what they were famous for, (laughs) I might Google just because it would be helpful for me to know their landscape, you know, what's going on. Or if someone was involved in some art show or something, but I would always tell my client that I Googled them, but oh, by the way, you know, you were talking about your art show. I Googled it and looked it up. It was, you know, it's pretty cool. It's, it's not considered unethical if it is harming the treatment and or an invasion of privacy to the client, then it could be considered unethical. But if it's public information, uh, then I, you know, I, I think that you wouldn't lose your license in, in all likelihood, unless something really wrong happened, and there was obvious neglect or, or harm that was happening. And it goes both ways, that for all therapists, we have to understand that our clients are possibly going to Google us, if not all of them. And we have to manage that. We have to make sure that everything that is public is absolutely okay to be viewed by all of your clients. And not just the clients that are high functioning, so to speak, but clients that might have a lot of issues regarding attachment counter or transference issues. And so you have to be really buttoned up about that. But yeah, uh, so you're wondering, I'm a Kate, if your therapist ever looks at yours, just ask him, just say, hey, do you ever Google me? (laughs) Uh, I don't want to sound conceited, but sometimes I I wonder because, now I don't know I'm a Kate, but I'm guessing you, you know, you have a lot of stuff on the internet, a lot of people do. And so you're just like, do they know this about me? You know, just just ask. Uh, Meta says, can a person have PTSD from imagined trauma? In other words, if a person believes that a traumatic event happened and exists and exhibits symptoms consistent with PTSD, would proof that it did not happen undermine the diagnosis? End of question. Well, so I'll give two answers. One is, is that, yes, if uh, for some people, um, for some people, when they apply the criteria in the DSM, especially when you really look at it the way it's written, someone could actually strip a PTSD label away if the event didn't meet the criterion. But that is ridiculous because as y'all know, if you've ever heard me talk about this before, PTSD it doesn't have a, a universal origin other than terror. So one could have an imagined event uh, that, uh, you know, put someone through absolute terror. For example, I've had clients who had psychosis temporarily and had a really horrible event. I had one client who thought that he was being chased by aliens and the CIA, and then they caught him and held him down and ripped out his spine. And he a hundred billion percent believed that this was happening. He could feel every single bone being ripped out of his body. And uh, that was a totally imagined event, right? And it absolutely could be uh, produce a tremendous amount of terror and thus PTSD. Uh, 
similar to someone with a personality disorder could perceive something happening with their social landscape with their partner they you know someone with borderline for example could see abandonment and betrayal in their partner when it uh, does not exist at all and absolutely have that be a horrific event and be deeply emotionally affected by it ptsd as a possibility included but yeah if you go off the strict definition for some people they actually would say that uh, you you don't qualify for the disorder anymore which i find just to be one of the dumbest things and and it just points to the fact that the dsm you know it's always evolving and and the ptsd criterion regarding what qualifies as an event that could qualify you for the ptsd diagnosis has always been expanding if i remember my history right it originally was only used for people coming back from war people in the military shell shock this sort of thing then eventually they started to include people who had been through a violent interaction then it was people who had been through a sexual in interactions you know sexually coercive abusive interaction and they talk about well childhood experiences anyway so zoe says do you have an opinion on psilocybin therapy for depression ptsd etc i've been microdosing for over a year now and it's completely changed my life for the better in canada it's slowly becoming normalized as an alternative if other medicines do, don't don't work end of question yeah i've talked about this a lot so i won't go over it again and in fact i had a few years ago someone on the podcast that is actually doing this kind of research i'll i'll do my um i'll just go to psychedelic uh so um yeah so two years ago february 2020 uh, you can find this episode in your feed or on the website or on youtube psychedelic assisted therapy uh, I interviewed a researcher, and that's a full deep dive into the topic because uh, she knows all the research. And um, I asked, I, uh, you know, a lot of the questions that I, I that you might have. So my and I find that this question this question comes up a lot, and I find that uh, I, I don't know. So everyone listen closely <laughs> because I feel like. Uh, I've been getting this question since the beginning of this podcast, and the, the reason why I'm sort of exasperated by it, it's not your fault, Zoe, but is because the rhetoric around psychedelic-assisted therapy is so overblown. Now, maybe the research will demonstrate that the claims are valid, but it doesn't look that way. So... I find that the culture around microdosing and, uh, you know, psychedelics, psilocybin, it, it's based on the way that we look at drugs in general, illicit drugs in general. And, and I think it appeals to people that are suffering and also have, uh, uh, you know, a sort of predilection or attraction to these kinds of drugs or drugs. Anyway, uh, but the evidence is clear uh, that initial evidence seems to point toward just what you said, that for people who uh, have treatment resistant depression, uh, PTSD, not so much. Uh, there's some research suggesting that it can assist in the therapy or could assist in uh, not developing PTSD after a, a traumatic event. But a lot of the research is extremely p preliminary. The reason why we're basically uh, stuck, you know, so when we first started studying antidepressants 50, 60, 70 years ago, or uh, uh, mood stabilizers, lithium, this kind of stuff, it wasn't illegal to do this sort of work. So we, we've had decades of research, you know, think about all of the antidepressants and the mood stabilizers and then the antipsychotics and you know just all these different meds just slowly being rolled out developed researched uh, given to literally millions of people around the planet more data comes in and say for example just prozac uh, an ssri we have the benefit of having it have been legalized in terms of the substance the compound the research and I don't know when SSRIs began. I'm guessing somewhere in the 70s-ish. 
maybe the 60s and so much money poured into the R&D to the research universities obviously a lot of motivation in my field to uh, try to find you know in the broader mental health field particularly psychiatry in terms of trying to find a, a better medication because antidepressants before SS SSRIs were kind of a sledgehammer a, a lot of times but anyway so just you know decade after decade millions of dollars millions of people thousands of trials and we're still learning in 2022 SSRIs the understanding of Prozac it's not over and and new theories start coming out new data uh, for example with uh, SSRIs and this is off the top of my head initial data seemed to point at a, a pretty high level of effectiveness uh, meaning that when you give uh, uh, Prozac to uh, you know a hundred people who are depressed um, and then you have another hundred that you don't give any SSRI to the difference between symptom reduction or remission of depression was X percent. I can't remember. It was something like 30 percent. I mean, it still isn't very high, right? Like uh, the way we talk about Prozac, it's like, you know, it works like a term. And for some it does, but for most it doesn't. Well, that that gap between the control group, um, because with the control group, just over time, you would find that, you know, 10, I can't remember the exact, but 10, 15 percent of those people will have a reduction in their depressive symptoms just for other reasons. So you, you always have to compare the treatment group to the control group. And so say the treatment group was like 50% and the control group was 15%. So the effectiveness we would say is 35%. And over time, that percentage, that difference between the treatment group and the control group has, has shrunk significantly and appears to be continuing to shrink, even though we're administering the same compound to the same people being diagnosed with the same things, not the same people, but the, uh, you know, presenting in the same way. Has the disorder changed over time? Have people changed over time? People's diets changed over time? Were the initial data, uh, uh, were they produced by studies that were more funded by the, um, you know, farm, uh, pharmacological companies, and now it's more independent studies? You know, it. It's hard to know, so we're still developing. So when it comes to psilocybin psychedelic you know, uh, therapy, we have decades to go before we can even say anything about what's happening. And that's what the experts will say. So if you, Zoe, have found that it has, quote unquote, completely changed your life for the better, then great. But it's possible that your life just happened to get better or that you're one of a very rare set of individuals where it does biologically affect you in a in a positive way um so we just can't tell and the amount of rhetoric on the internet is like this is a universally wonderful for all you know people i, I know people you know they'll be talking about how they don't even suffer from depression and or, or any of the indications of this sort of therapy and they'll just start microdosing because they want to improve their energy or their life or something and so it, it has a ton of pseudoscience around it a, a ton of uh you know dubious claims now the data might come out and demonstrate all the claims were on you know on point but there's no way to know and I, I'm old enough to know and have seen many different treatments come out over the years that panned out that were very popular at one point and did not pan out so and and all you got to uh, you know look to are all the different fad diets that come out that you know tons of research showing that this you know all the different things about superfoods and low fat you know all just and those people that would write articles or give a talk on tv would you know they would look to research and and particularly anecdotal evidence right so in with the psychedelic research psych psychedelic therapy we're in that zone where uh, the experts will say there's some prelim preliminary evidence showing that it does help with treatment resistant things it also can help with people as they're dying actually because it helps them to have a greater sense of well-being as they head towards death there's some research around that so now is there a viable mechanism 
that this com- that the compounds involved in psychedelics, psilocybin specifically, could improve someone's mood. Absolutely, it the the same uh, um, mechanisms in the brain that are being affected by psychedelics are similar to, if not the same, as the medications that we have already known uh, and have been prescribing to people that affect depression and PTSD, not PTSD specifically, but mood and, and well-being and feeling a greater sense of calm and, and satisfaction. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised if 30, 40 years from now, the consensus and there's enough research behind us pointing towards this is one of the you know 50 medications that a psychiatrist will try do i think it's going to revolutionize our field no i do not in fact the the data doesn't seem to show that at all and know that the research models that are typically being studied involve talk therapy uh, and they use the psychedelics to enhance the human experience the like the in the episode i did a couple years ago they have two clinician researchers sitting next to you and walking you through your psychedelic experience for hours so it's not just someone taking now it's different right that's a full dose it's not microdosing. but all right let's take a break get back lightning round All right, we're back from the break. I want to do an OPP, an old patron praise for those patrons who became patrons all the way back in May of 2020 and have stayed patrons ever since. We have Elizabeth from Altoona, Wisconsin, I believe. We have Beata from God knows where. Beata, I don't know if that's even how you pronounce it, but my great, great grandmother was named Beata or great 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 grandmother it was she was from Sweden and we also have Krisha from Hampton Virginia Linda from Haymarket Virginia Al from Seattle Uh, I love a name like Al my dad's name is Al (laughs) we have Isabella from Port Washington Ohio we have Mema from God knows where Vincent upper tier patron Vincent from God knows where and Ines from God knows where she Taz from God knows where Taryn from God knows where Nader Anna uh, a H Monica Eva from God knows where we have Cynthia from Woodenville Washington beautiful Woodenville close to where I grew up uh, on the plateau Michelle from San Gabriel California uh, Leah from God knows where Georgia from Edinburgh great Ed- Edinburgh is that how you say it? <laughs> uh, B. Pearson from Blaine, Minnesota. Alyssa from Santa Ana, California. Tasha from Independence, Missouri. Shea from Oslo, Norway. We got Ryan from Minneapolis. Emma from Tempe, Arizona. Rachel from Charlotte, North Carolina. Max from San Francisco. Jordan from Calif- Visalia, California. And Sarah from uh, Denmark, I think. Or no, Germany, probably, right? Uh, And I feel like I've communicated with you before, Sarah. Anyway, so thank you all for being a patron through Thick and Thin. Next question, Adults Out of Order uh, says, Tough or bluff, Kirk? Digitization, digitization, well, digitalization of schools have increased student learning. Well, uh, I would say tough to that but it's hard to know because the digitalization of schools has been are are you talking about a pandemic like videotization or are you just talking about how teachers use computers and emails and how uh, there's students will use more online resources or computer assisted uh, uh, learning programs. So actually I'm just going to say tough, but I I actually don't really know what you're talking about specifically, but I do know a little bit, obviously I'm not an expert, but about how uh, there are ways in which more computers can be used and, and programs can be used to actually help kids learn more independently because, you know, the model of original pedagogy is 
you have a teacher, you have 25 students, 30 students, and all the kids work at the same pace. They all learn everything at the same time. And the reason for that, of course, is because it's cheaper. Uh, it, it would be much more effective if every child had an individual education experience. Uh, you would obviously want to involve group experiences, interaction with their classmates. But uh, if every student had their own teacher, then that makes more sense, right? Obviously, you can't do that cost-wise, but you can have computers that uh, uh, figure out how to walk someone through a lesson, can detect uh, deficits and strengths, and accelerate where you can and slow down where you need to. And there's there's a, a fair amount of research in that. And um, of course, you know, it threatens teachers' jobs, so they're not enthusiastic necessarily about it uh, i'm sure there are many teachers who are enthusiastic about it because you do need a teacher there to you know make sure that the kids are on track um, sometimes they'll have questions obviously that the computer can't answer so uh anyway but i'm not an expert Leica says why is the mmpi in a true false format it's always some it's always frustrating to take the mmpi because there's no option for sometimes or somewhat agree, or somewhat disagree, or neutral, or I don't know, or I don't remember, also seems to leave little room for insight. When I was evaluated, I filled the margins with notes. Smiley face. Also, what happens if someone leaves one or more questions unanswered? End of question. Yeah, uh, it, is, it is frustrating. So if you don't know, the MMPI is a personality test. It's the primary test that forensic psychologists or all psychologists will use to uh, as one of the measures to assess someone's personality and psychopathology. And uh, uh, it's a true-false format. So it'll be like, I like newspapers more than magazines. And I think there is a question like that on there. And you're like, how is that? What does that have to do with personality? It does for some reason. And they find that in the research. And anyway, so... They, they will say true or false. And you're like, well, I don't know. Sometimes I like newspapers and sometimes I like magazines. It kind of depends. Or I like both. Or I, I don't like either one of them. So, But you're forced to pick an answer. And the point of the MMPI is not to... And some of the questions are pretty straightforward. Like, I've thought about suicide before. That kind of thing. But some of the questions are much more nuanced, right? And in fact, I would say over half of the questions, most people would at least like a, a middle ground answer in there somewhere. But the research actually d demonstrates that we don't need that third response. We can gauge someone's personality and their psychopathology, even though these questions are, you know, they hamstring you in terms of options. And so whenever you're taking the MAPI, uh, just know that the algorithms are uh, perhaps more important than the exact items that you're answering. So, for example, if I you know, administered an MPI and I found that the person answered you know, true or false to a few questions that uh, provided some concern for me, like individual items, I might ask the individual, okay, you said true to this question. What do you mean by that? Then you would absolutely be able to give nuance. You'd be like, well, I said true because I don't, I didn't know which one to pick. But uh, uh, you know, if I if I had a a, a, more, a different box I could check, I would I would have said sometimes, and it kind of depends. So you know, don't worry about filling it out in this true false format as if it's somehow going to be read literally by the evaluator the algorithm compiles all those responses the hundreds of true false questions that you answer and determines based on research what personality traits and psychopathology is likely to be present with you so it's not it's not taken on a question by question basis and the people before you upon which the research and the conclusions have have been nor meaning that, you know, when they originally started uh, doing this, and then when it was revised, they would give these uh, uh, true false questions to people that they knew already had issues. You know, it's like okay, this person has schizophrenia. Let's give them this or these 
this thousand people have schizophrenia. Let's give them the MPI. Let's let's look at the way they typically respond. And this profile of responses is associated with schizophrenia. You know, you just start going down the line. So it's not like people look at the individual questions and say, oh, they said true to that. That must mean this. You can't do that. You can't look at even a, a, a human can't look at a set of questions on the MPI and make any conclusions. It's all based on the conglomerate of the responses. Again, there are some items on there where you could follow up with the client or the evaluate the examinee, but um, you can't know that. Um, the other question you ask is what happens if someone leaves one or more questions unanswered? Well, potentially it could invalidate the test completely. So, you know, you don't want to do that because you're just wasting your time. And if you have a question about that, you should ask your evaluator and your evaluator will say, just answer to the best of your ability. You have to answer every single question, that kind of thing. Um, MK says, how is the MMPI2 a reliable diagnostic tool given that the questions seem open to interpretation? For example, the MMPI question, at times I hear so well that it bothers me. Sounds like it could be misophonia, but according to the tool, responding true indicates deviant thinking and experiences. Again, end of question. So again, uh, it, it, that's not what it means. <laughs> I don't know where you heard that, but at that's that's not what the test is designed to do. I can't look at a question at times I hear so well that it bothers me and see a true uh, you know endorsement to that item and think it indicates deviant thinking and experiences. It I'm guessing where you got that from was there are certain questions that have been seen to be associated with quote unquote deviant thinking and experiences. Uh, and when you take them as a whole, then you have an indication of something, but you couldn't look at one item and know anything. The other thing to keep in mind is the word deviant is not necessarily what you think. Deviant is outside of the norm. So it doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you or evil about you. It just means that you've deviated from from the norm you you don't the person it, it's a it's a small indication potentially if you say true to that response that that item uh, that or i should say it's a tick in the column of potential deviant thinking and experience meaning thinking and experiences that are outside of the norm uh, but you need a you need a, a lot of ticks in that column before you can say anything about that. That's why if you've heard me talk about this extensively in the trial episodes, uh, you know, the Deb Heard trial episodes, that's where they talk about elevations that say you answer true to this one and it elevates that scale to, uh, you know, up uh, one tick. Well, you would need several other items to be endorsed or to be indicated in, in a direction that indicates deviant thinking and experiences for that scale to rise above a certain threshold upon which you can interpret it. You know, you keep hearing me talk about, you know, 55, 60 and 65. Uh, for some people, it has to be 65 to interpret and everything below that is normal. For some people, they would say you, you can say minor things at 55, you could say moderate things at, fifth, at 60, and you could say major things at 65, anyway. Art Lover says, what do you think about, oh, a little just final note on MPI stuff. There is no possible way that you, uh, or really other mental health clinicians who are not psychologists, and are not trained in this there's no possible way that you could understand any of this stuff it is so arcane and complex in fact a lot of the things i've said thus far i'm only 85 percent sure of the things that i've said <laughs> because it's been a while since i've studied it you know it's the the things i'm telling you are pretty elementary to psychometrics and personality testing and the mpi but but I'll tell you, you know, going through the trial and hearing Dr. Curry and, uh, you know, Dr. Spiegel and Dr. Hughes and uh, Dr. Shaw talk about the MPI and the PAI and the TSI-2 and the ATR scale and the case scale and the 3-6 code type. And I, uh, at the beginning of watching the trial, I was going off of my kind of foggy memory about the whole uh 
subject and topic, which I knew very well 10 years ago, 15 years ago, but you know, it fades and I haven't done that kind of work. Like the last time I administered an MPI would have been eight years ago, seven years ago. So it's been a long time and there's been a lot of other things crammed into this tiny brain of mine. So it's, it's, uh, so as time went on, as I was watching the trial, I, it started to come back to me and I would also look up research and pull the books off my shelf and actually commit to relearning this stuff, which I will say is kind of embarrassing because uh, I think I, I cringe. I'm worried about the initial episodes where I was talking about things and having it be um, dubious in terms of the things I was saying. Anyway. Um, but the point is, is that if you just Google MPI <laughs> or personality, to, you know, for example, uh, the vast majority of the public, when they think about personality testing, they think of Myers-Briggs or they think of Enneagram or astrology of all things. And it's not, no psychologist or I don't know a single psychologist that uses Enneagram. I, I know one psychologist out of hundreds that I know of that don't use it. I know one that uses Myers Briggs, and I don't even think she, and and she's not. Um, she doesn't do assessments. She she's a psychotherapist that really loves Jung and, and Myers Briggs. Anyway, so uh, in, in standard psychological assessing, uh, Myers Briggs isn't even talked about. We, it doesn't even get brought up. It's not even a thing that is, you know, on the topic list it's not in any of the books because it's so far from uh, the standard of evaluating personality that it doesn't even it, it 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 there's no use in even bringing it up <laughs> but when it comes to the public uh it's this whole other thing you know and uh the mpi is so complicated and the uh, the questions, the science around it, the research around it, the interpretation of it, especially it's really hard. So when you Google stuff like this and you get these answers or you have your hands on some kind of handout that shows something like just understand that you you probably have no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> it's a it's a completely different world. And um and the especially in the interpretation, which we clearly can see from the trial that it's an art form, right? Because you have two experienced forensic psychologists and Dr. Curry and Dr. Hughes looking at the same data, having the opposite, uh, uh, you know, conclusions, which shows that, it, you know, it's it's debatable as to what anyway. art lover says. What do you think about the public nature of trials? Uh, good question here. Appropriate. What do you think about the public nature of trials involving domestic or sexual abuse and violence and the televising or broadcasting via social media? Some think public trials keep things honest. I think it could be re-traumatizing for victims to be publicly cross-examined. End of question. Yeah, absolutely. I, If I had my preference, none of these things would be broadcast. I mean, there's there's no real need. You know, you can have people in the courtroom, reporters and such like that, document, documentarian, documentarists, people who'd make documentaries. And, uh, you know, the story can be told, like I said, journalist, blah, blah, blah. But to have, I mean, just imagine for yourself, if you've ever been through something like this, you, um, you're accused of sexually abusing your children, <laughs> It just put, let's just put that out there. And uh, or you're a child who was victimized and you have to give a deposition or go to court. You know, these kinds of things are not televised. Right. So it uh, but I think it's all on the same spectrum. I I feel terrible for Amber Heard. Like, let's say that she was lying and that she or at least was lying enough or left out a lot by omission, right? And deserved the verdict, which, you know, I, I have no idea if that's true or not. And no one could except for Johnny and Amber would know that. But, and even then 
uh, you know, we might not know if they know it because Johnny could have been so intoxicated and Amber could have been so distorted given her personality disorder, which I don't even know exists. But if she does, she could she could see things that aren't even there and, and don't happen. Not hallucination, but, you know, borderline distortions. But so uh, maybe no one knows if the trial verdict was accurate or not. But let's just say it was accurate. And uh, that's a rough experience to go through anyway so i i don't understand why it has to be televised you know it it's rough to begin with <laughs> and uh yeah I, now you could argue i'm part of the problem by uh talking about it but i i think that i can do i'm trying to do a public good by providing what i see as a compassionate educated uh, nuanced, you know, attempted to be balanced take on the matter. You know what I mean? So, um, so yeah, I, in general, I, I just don't th think that it's critical to our democracy that these things are televised. Yeah. L says, what do you think of bachelor contestants saying that they have PTSD from their time in the show? end of question well i didn't know that um i don't know uh, you could get ptsd from being on the bachelor absolutely uh, I, it would be rare i would imagine but remember you would need to have absolute terror and i could see that happening for people in a variety of different circumstances but is it more likely that contestants on the bachelor are saying that they have ptsd when they're doing that thing that people do, which is, oh my God, I'm so clean, I'm so OCD, or, oh my God, I, I'm so scatterbrained, I have ADHD. You know, it's it's like, just stop it, people. Just say you're scatterbrained. Just say you're anal and you're super clean. <laughs> and uh, just say that, say you've been traumatized by your experience on The Bachelor. Don't, don't but don't say you have PTSD unless, unless you actually have it. Now, a lot of clinicians make the mistake of confusing trauma reactivity in general with PTSD or, or trauma conditions or the effects of trauma. And sometimes people think, well, that, you know, it's like mild PTSD. No, not necessarily. I mean, there are, a lot of, there are a lot of effects of having gone through something that was really difficult. And there's also a lot of different types of difficult, right? There's terror, like being sexually assaulted or having bullets flying over your head or a bullet going through your best friend's skull while you're at war or otherwise, you know, that's terror, right? Uh, but there's also other kinds of difficult experiences like being made to feel powerless or being humiliated extensively, being rejected extensively, this kind of thing. So can there be long lasting effects from that? Absolutely. There usually are, but to lump that into PTSD is probably uh, conceptually wrong and potentially problematic in terms of uh, demeaning those who actually have PTSD. Adults Out of Order says, are you currently working on a deep dive? If yes, what what is the topic and do you have any sense of when you might be publishing it? I don't mind if it takes months. I'm just curious. End of question. Well, thanks, Adults Out of Order, for saying that. I will level with you that I keep so this I'm just gonna I won't bore you with the details but I I feel like being able to publish a deep dive is like crossing a finish line and every time I turn a corner and think that the finish line will be there I don't see it keeps getting further or I'm running toward the finish line while the finish line is receding away from me at, 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 a, at the same pace that I'm running. And because I, 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 it is the core of my professional satisfaction is to do these deep dives. It is. And so I, now some people might say, well, Kirk, you know, slow the F down. And yeah, sure, I get it. But um, when I, you know, pull together all the priorities again i won't bore you with the details because there's a lot of different things that we do for this podcast you know it's not just content uh it's planning for 
the 14th or planning for the scholarship, reading the scholarship. By the way, submit your scholarship essays. Uh, deadline July 15, 2022, $3,000. Also, uh, the art grant should be running by the time this is published. $1,000 art grant. Go to the website. Uh, deadline July 15. We'll announce those during the anniversary show on YouTube in September. And um, so, you know, it's not just content. It's all these all these other things. It's uh, like, actually, I'll tell you, um, Stacy, she's in charge of the merch, T-shirts and mugs and all that kind of stuff. And she was, you know, screaming <laughs> the other day uh, in her office. And I come in there, she, she's just so angry because the uh, um, merch company that we've been working with just took down uh, several of our designs. You know, the take care of yourself because you deserve it. And then the, um, you know, if if being healthy is to be corny, then be corny shirt. And, and, and some other shirt as well. And those two are the most popular, those by far, of the different items that people buy. And the Teespring or Spring, which is the merch company, it just disappeared. And so Stacy would reach out to them and they'd be like, yeah, I don't know. And they, she would go back and forth with them and uh, be in long story short, it's a total disaster. And the, the company is being completely incompetent and unhelpful. And meanwhile, people are like, Hey, I wanted to buy that, buy that thing. And where is it? And, you know, people are being nice about it, but it, so we have to spend hours problem solving that and then we're like well because i've been wanting to jump ship from them for a long time because the the quality of their stuff has gone down over the years and so i've been like oh, well hopefully they'll improve their quality a little bit more but when this happened you know it was and then there's kind of an emotional component to this and this is just one of a hundred things that stacy and i do every day and so there's an emotional component where we have to kind of like vent to each other about the idiots that are running this company and uh like just to give you one detail about it so stacy's like uh you know what's going on they're going back and forth he's like yeah, i don't know there's really lackadaisical responses and, and then they're like well uh, we don't know what happened i guess you're just gonna have to start it over again like just you know act like you just started the line for the first so she, she has to redesign it and re like because you have to pick all the different items you have to pick the colors of all the items you have to set up the the pages like it you know take it's a lot of labor and the fact that they just lost whole chunks of our merchandise portfolio and have no way of recovering it and anyway so we keep clicking on things and and so uh uh, you know, Cece is going back for, she's like, well, how do we not, how do we know that this item isn't going to be taken down? They're like, well, actually it might be because you have too many options, meaning that, um, you, you know, on one design, like the take care of yourself because you deserve it line that you have too many, uh, items that are available. Like, cause we have the shirts and the pillows and the, uh, you know, I can't remember the, I think there's a mug and there's, you know, there's, there's a few things. And on, each of the items we provide too many options for the colors but just for, for you coders out there and i know you you're out there imagine that that is the bug and your your website can't handle the t-shirt having you know 10 options in terms of color not because there's a problem in the manufacturing but because there's a problem in the code right but you're not sure that it's a problem in the code you think it is so you're telling us that we can only, we can have to limit the color options for the shirt to like three instead of what you have available, which is like 25. <laughs> and when people order things, obviously they want options, right? And so, so imagine that's your solution is to tell us, the customer, to limit the options to you, the customer. And yeah, so, so Stacy and I will just start, you know, just screaming at the computer for a few hours because so anyway that's just one of the hundred so many things and all that stuff just puts but pushes back because in order for me to do a deep dive i have to i i have to have 16 hour blocks of time each day where i'm uninterrupted 
and there's nothing that will throw me off my emotional or at least 10 hours eight hours maybe because and i need consecutive days where i have that free time because if i do it in piecemeal i I forget stuff that i've already you know researched or thought of and so but like i said it's the core of my professional satisfaction so i i I feel like i'm i'm almost there and i my goal was to have a deep dive every other month and then so i'd have a deep dive one month and the next month i'd have a follow-up in which when you all would email in i i i had an idea to do a deep dive on on the word toxic because i want to figure out how that's being used linguistically in the in and outside the field the other thing i want to do is deep dives on the rest of the personality source schizoid schizotypal uh paranoid What, what what else have i not done and so Um, I I also want to redo my attachment deep dive. I also want to redo my narcissism deep dive. I I recently re-listened to the narcissism deep dive when it was rerun and I I hated it. I thought it was, I thought it was really dumb. The ways, the things I was saying and I I just thought, oh, what was wrong with my brain that day? (laughs) So, um, you know, I I don't know when, but I feel soon. Like I, I feel, I feel like, and again, this could just be me looking at the finish line and seeing it recede away from me, but I feel like the next deep dive could come out in the next four weeks, uh, uh, six weeks. Anyway, let's take a break, get back lightning round, actual lightning round. All right, back from the break. So you cats says, where is Bob? I miss him. He has a special place in my heart. Yeah, for a few weeks or longer, he was actually in Europe and in Italy specifically. He was there for a writing conference. Uh, it was just like 10 or 15 students and him and Colleen also toured around Italy, Florence and other places. And so he was unavailable for the podcast. Uh, Zoe says, why do non-vegans get so defensive around the word vegan and vegan things to the point where they have an immediate revulsion at vegan food, even if it's pizza or the like? It's probably a societal learnt thing, but I'm curious if there's a psychology behind it. Yeah, I've talked about this before. It is weird. And I, I, it is an odd thing that when people learn that someone else is vegetarian or vegan, people will freak out (laughs) and uh, there's a lot of reasons for it one is is that there's a a notion i don't know about around the world but in the united states that if you don't eat meat you're a wimp and you're also a communist literally there are people in my country who believe that if you're vegan that means you're a communist (laughs) Uh, I think more mainstream, though, uh, it's it's that if you don't eat meat, there's just something weird about you. It all also uh, it stems. So there's a lot of different factors. That's one. One is is another one is that there's a lot of culture and tradition in with regards to meat because in the past and to some extent still meat is expensive and and was for special occasions and so the meat you know the turkey at thanksgiving for example the reason why the turkey is so fetishized at thanksgiving i believe is because it wasn't every day that you could afford a giant turkey and spend the time cooking it da 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 and so much of your childhood and your your family and your culture and your ethnicity is wrapped up in these food items and and if those food items involve a lot of meat which they would because the feasts would involve a lot of meat items to reject those things is threatening to people so that's another reason another is a fear of the unknown another is that in the past like 90s there was a lot of uh, experimentation with trying to make vegan and vegetarian food that emulated uh, you know, carnist food. Like there, I remember in the nineties, I ate a lot of morning star farms stuff, which there were these vegetarian sausage patties that I loved. And, uh, over in the, so in the beginning, or, and, but before that you would have veg, you know, vegetarian sausage, 
that was terrible. I mean, it was absolutely just horrible. I've yet to have a good vegetarian hot dog, actually. <laughs> um, it, you know, to make a good hot dog, it's apparently really hard, which makes sense. Anyway, I'm sure there is by now in 2022 that there's a good vegan. By the way, we're sponsored by HelloFresh, <laughs> which has a lot of vegan. Um, and I don't know if you caught the episode, but, you know, I brought it up during an episode once, HelloFresh, and Berto was like, oh, I've been doing that for five years. And I was like, oh, my God, you know, because when HelloFresh reached out to me, I, I was like, I should have had Berto do the live read since he's been actually doing it for five years. Anyway, um, so I think that's another thing is, is that uh, for many people, they've tried vegan and vegetarian food, and it was, and it was awful. Or... You know, when they first started making non-gluten bread or non-gluten cookies, I remember it was just, it was a horrible thing. I just remember being like, I, this is, you just shouldn't attempt, if you're going to go non, no gluten, like you just don't try to make bread. I've since had non-gluten bread. That's actually pretty good. But in the beginning, so that's another thing, just experience. People have a bad experience. They never look back. Um. I also just think it's part of our culture, you know, like when people say a dingo stole my baby. Um, if you're old enough to remember Seinfeld, you know, it's this ongoing joke. Why is that funny? A dingo st stole my baby. Why is that funny? Well, because they said it on a comedy TV show. They had a laugh track or they turned on the, uh, the laugh sign in the live studio and audience and everyone laughed about it. And so we all just, just decided that was funny. But there's nothing funny about it, even if you don't know the background. But particularly if you know the background, that's literally a, a reference to a real mother screaming as her literal infant child is being dragged into the darkness, into the wilderness by a dingo, which is a small dog-like creature in Australia, right? And to make a joke out of that is, is like, what? <laughs> And that woman was falsely accused of killing the baby and falsely imprisoned for years because of sexism and lack of understanding of psychology and grief. So to make a joke out of that is abhorrent to me. Um, why is it funny? Well, because people decided it was funny in this stupid way. In the same way that people decided vegetarian and veganism is funny because it's, you know, someone made a, made a joke about it in the aughts during a, some TV show and suddenly it's... It's now funny, you know, in the same way that being gay is used to be funny and to some extent still is among certain people. There's nothing inherently funny about being gay. Like I remember when I was a kid, I have a vague memory of wondering why it's funny that if a man wants to marry a man, why is that funny? <laughs> like what's what's the joke there? But you hear it enough times and you see all your adults laughing, eventually it just, yeah, that's hilarious. It, it's, it's humiliating to that person. I get it. But it's not logically humiliating to someone that they're gay. <laughs> like, it doesn't mean anything, right? Um, so anyway, like, there, I'm sure there are other factors. but And oh, another factor would be probably like the meat industry, probably propping up certain ideas and maybe even jokes <laughs> around this sort of thing. Um, yeah, threat of change, you know, threat of progress, that kind of stuff. Like I says, what are your thoughts on the DSM-5 TR? It seems there is much contention, uh, LMAO. Yeah, well, the DSM-5 TR, uh, and I haven't really looked into it extensively because I don't need to as a private practitioner that no longer, you know, is on insurance panels anymore i don't um really have to be super up to date but from my uh, comparison and reading the different briefs by apa is that there aren't that many differences in the new ds so the dsm-5 came out 2013 and the revised edition came out uh, this year 2022 i believe and <clears throat> um and it, it usually, whenever they do the revised edition, it's usually just like cleaning some stuff up. And that's mainly what it was, just some, some minor issues that needed to be adjusted. It's sort of like, 
the patch that comes out after a game is released. You know, it's it's that it's not like releasing a whole other game. It, you know, Civilization Six comes out, and then there's a patch that comes out that kind of corrects because you you try to test all for all the problems prior to release, but you you catch other problems as you know millions of people are actually using the product, and that's what was true for DSM Five. But the other thing is, is society has changed since 2013. Uh, at the very least. I, ideas and movements have become stronger and more noticeable to the APA, such as, uh, for example, with gender, with trans people. It, it's actually really weird for me to see the language in the DSM-5 and to see what they revised, because it was just uh, nine years ago that, uh, you know, gender dysphoria were, was under a, a category of disorders of sex development, meaning that being trans is a disorder in your development of, of your sex, which is not the way that we see it anymore. And of course, in 2013, it wasn't the way the experts saw it, but it was the way the, the mainstream psychiatry and perhaps psychologically saw it that way. And of course, the mainstream is, is so different now in 2022. They, so they changed the language, thankfully, to... Um, differences in sex development. Now, we still have a problem in the DSM regarding sexuality, not only with gender dysphoria, but also with with paraphilias and other kinds of things. And if you listen to my recent deep dive uh, or recent uh, rerun on that, you, know, you can get a full description of that stuff. But but other kinds of language changes around gender. Instead of desired gender, they changed the wording to experienced gender. So in the past, it was thought that if someone was trans, that they, if they were assigned female at birth, they desired to be a man. But we now have a different concept of that that says, no, they, they are a man. They just need to affirm that gender they, they're not trying to become a man they already are a man and so they have uh, they've changed the word the wording to experienced gender uh, another phrase that they changed was cross-sex medical procedure they changed it to gender affirming medical procedure another uh, uh, phrase that they changed was natal natal female they changed it to individual assigned female at birth so and in 2013, especially when it was being developed in you know 2011, individual assigned a female at birth, these kinds of phrases were not mainstream in the least. So much has changed regarding trans and, and uh, non-binary and gender in general, uh, which is good, and the DSM-5 TR needed to reflect those changes. Um, but the most significant thing to me was, uh, and there's also some minor changes around ethnicity and race in terms of the languaging. But the biggest change to me in DSM-5 TR is they actually included prolonged grief. If you've heard me talk about it before, you know that it was included in a chapter of the DSM-5 as, I can't remember the name of the chapter, but something like disorders that need further data to justify being put in the DSM in the DSM official. And prolonged grief did cross that threshold. I thought it w was going to cross the threshold, and many experts also believed it was going to cross that threshold to be included in DSM-5 uh, nine years ago. But it must have been very close to the finish line because, you know, these kinds of things take uh, so long, <laughs> just so long. The, the, proponents of, the proponents of a prolonged grief or complicated grief diagnosis have been at it for decades and you know they almost got there to it, but they did anyway so uh, i appreciate the diagnosis in the dsm because it needs to be identified and it, it is something that is uh, uh you know in the human experience now of course and you've heard me talk about this before as well the problem with putting it in the dsm is that for some clinicians who have a very surface level understanding of the disorder and of grief will falsely or wrongly or wrongheadedly pathologize people going through normal grief. How do we differentiate between normal grief and prolonged grief? And I, I'm actually 
a little bugged that they called it prolonged grief instead of complicated grief because prolonged really puts this date to it that if you have grief beyond a certain you know timeline then you now start to qualify for the disorder um now um but it is something that i find to be conceptually consistent and a lot of the research demonstrates this but you have to understand the diagnosis it's similar to ptsd or something that or autism or a personality disorder you can't just read the criteria and be able to diagnose this even if you're a clinician you you got to understand the disorder very very well before you can confidently use it in in any clinical manner but i'll tell you the the spirit behind complicated prolonged grief is that for some people when they go through a major loss of any kind whether it's death or loss of a job or loss of an ability like you can no longer walk or you start to have dementia or you lose your a, a concept like some people will feel grief around the loss of innocence regarding climate change that kind of thing so there's a wide variety of types of losses but or loss of a pet that kind of thing or a relationship obviously divorce and for some people for everyone when they go through a significant loss they will have significant emotional behavioral effects that we call grief um, intense emotional pain uh, temporary depression demoralization preoccupation crying maybe anxiety difficult sleeping or sleeping too much um, you know eating changes behavioral changes maybe it's harder to work concentration problems and that's normal we don't pathologize that but how do we differentiate that between what we would label as prolonged grief well it's it's it takes experience and wisdom and you have to understand the research and you have to have a lot of experience yourself not only with your own grief but also in treating people as they go through grief because you have to be able to hear the differences for example if if someone say lost their mother five years ago and they come into a session and they start crying about it and we have five sessions where that's all we talk about i would not know if the person had prolonged grief because i don't know if they're just having like a, a temporary upwelling of grief about the loss of their mother that happened five years ago because of an anniversary thing or whatever so but an inexperienced clinician might look at that and say well it was five years ago they're having intense sadness right now they're crying all the time really preoccupied seems weird it was five years ago how come they're still crying so often i mean whole sessions five whole sessions in a row they're crying about it they have prolonged grief and when you label it that way and you tell the client there's something wrong with you that could really set the client backwards significantly in fact a lot of research shows that therapists can harm clients a lot due to uh, when they come in wanting to talk about grief because the research shows that therapists as a whole are really dismal when it comes to treating grief there's something like a th i can't read the exact stats but something like a third of clients will not get better at all a third will get better and a third will get worse Be a third will get worse because they came into therapy so really if you're going through grief you're really just flipping a coin in terms of whether it's a good idea to go to therapy or not not because of you but because therapists are just so dismal at understanding this because there's no mandatory courses or continuing ed or and, the, and I, I still see therapists talking about the five stages of grief, which is just ridiculous. I mean, we gave that up decades ago. So how can we tell? Well, you know, so now if that person came in and cried five sessions in a row and then I assessed like for the past five years, they, they've had a drastically different emotional and behavioral life negatively as opposed to before their mother died five years ago. They have drifted away from all their friends they have a hard time uh, with the memories. It, it feels as though the mother died yesterday to this individual and other things of that uh, uh, in that category, in that area, then I would actually apply the label of prolonged complicated grief. But what's the, what's the line between crying uh, appropriately and crying too much? What's the line between thinking about 
your mother that died five years ago, uh, uh, what's the difference between it being excessive and being normal? It, it's, it's hard to gauge. But I will tell you that when, you, when you're an expert such as myself, it's easy to tell the difference. In the same way that, you know, when I talk about personality disorder criteria, it's like, well, what's the difference between someone who idealizes and devalues and someone who just has a volatile relationship, as everyone does? Um, well, to the expert, it's easy to tell the difference. <laughs> like, y you see the it's clear as day. But if you're not experienced in that evaluation, then you'll, you might mess it up. But I do appreciate it being in there because I, it is a real disorder because it, in si similar to depression or anxiety, it, it ruins people's lives. And, and something like 5%, 10% of people that go through significant losses will develop complicated or, or prolonged grief. It's, it's a fair amount of people. So, yeah. Um, so that's the SM5 rev revised. All right, just a couple more. Destiny says... Depending where you're from, some jobs have certain disqualifiers that will make them reject you if you have it, such as a personality disorder. Do you think this law is needlessly discriminatory? Because I think psychological checkups on people who want to become pilots is necessary, and it's not discriminatory if you reject them because of it. End of question. Yeah, absolutely. This is a huge problem. It, it, it's a massive misunderstanding of mental disorders or and or the so there's a possibility that the airlines and the pilot associations absolutely understand that if a pilot suffers from major depressive disorder that doesn't mean anything in terms of their competence as a pilot because of course it doesn't um but they're worried that if there's a problem with a plane say a crash and it comes out that the pilot did suffer from a mental disorder and the airline and the pilot association did nothing, then the airline would worry that they would be sued or be or lose business. So it's possible that they're discriminating against pilots who have mental conditions, not because they think it's scientific, but because it's good PR because of the optics. I don't know, but either way, it's massively discriminatory in a criminal way. It's ridiculous. A third of Americans, and thus probably a third of pilots, suffer from something in the DSM. So, and the chance that every single pilot that is flying today, all of them do not have a mental disorder in the DSM, the notion of that is ridiculous. A half of Amer half of Americans will qualify for a diagnosis at some point in their life, and in my experience, every American will be close to the uh, threshold of an actual diagnosis uh, throughout their life. <laughs> I don't know a single person who isn't close to a threshold, if not over a threshold, into a diagnosis. So, um, if not multiple, right? It's just not possible. It's just not possible for humans to be the way that we think humans are supposed to be anyway. So yeah, it's, it's a, it, it's ignorance of the disorders and uh, what actually they mean. It's, it's um, stigma around disorders. It's um, yeah, it's all sorts of problems. <laughs> like for example, uh, there was a pilot in Europe that flew a plane into a mountain and killed himself and everyone on the plane a totally despicable act but the headlines were depressed pilot kills everyone that kind of thing and i it was it was so upsetting to see that because he wasn't de okay let's say he was depressed that doesn't have anything to do with it depressed people don't murder hundreds of innocent people so now they might have suicidal thoughts and, and the other thing was, is he wasn't psychotic. He, it, it appears, if I remember the news story right, that he was essentially a mass murderer who wanted to kill himself and did so. Uh, but it has nothing to do with depression. You know, it's like with uh, the killings in um, Sandy Hook Elementary, that it's like autistic kid kills a bunch of children. And it's like, no. <laughs> 
It's not autistic kid. It is kid who did a horrific thing. And yeah, at maybe the last sentence, by the way, he was also on the spectrum, but that has nothing to do with what happened. <laughs> it's like this association, you know, that people have. Uh, yeah, it's, it's just um, ridiculous. Our, we still live in that stigmatized world and uh, it'll, I'll be dead before that stigma is gone. I'm quite sure of it. PM, PM me cup noodles says two questions unrelated to psychotherapy. Number one, what's the story behind your band name? Bread knife incident. Okay. This is a easy pod question I could get behind. That's the name of the channel in discord, by the way. Um, well, so I, uh, had two friends who I had played with musically before and we, well, okay. <laughs> I won't tell the whole story because it's boring, but there was a time in my life, uh, this would have been 15 years ago or something, and I was really getting tired of, well, actually, so I'll just go a little bit further back. Me and Umberto were in a band called Missionary, and this band was extremely buttoned up. We had synced videos to all of our songs we had like we brought our own light shows or this is mainly Berto would bring light shows to the to the venues we had uniforms and art and you know press releases and uh, we recorded the songs pretty in, in detail we, you know it was a very meticulous band and and we took everything very ser seriously and there wasn't any room for improvisation or rock and roll and so when that band started to fizzle out i just wanted to create a, a, an environment where people could just relax and play music and not have the pressure of any kind of show and so i invited all of my musician friends over to my living room and we called ourselves the living room butchers because we would butcher cover songs and i, I purposely wanted to not aspire to make good music i just wanted to create you know something that was fun it was just for us and we played a couple shows but i'm pretty sure no one liked us and but we and we had a blast you know well two of the guys in that band i knew pretty well and this one time uh it was just the three of us because it was a five person band and, and uh, there was one practice where it was just the three of us and i was like huh this actually feels really good and so we created a, another band um, with just the three. We just sort of broke off the three of us into another band. And our first practice, they came over to the house, and the bassist, Brant, had this giant um, uh, bandage on his hand. He's bassist, so on his left hand. And so it made it hard for him to play the bass. It was kind of a bummer because it was our first jam. You know, It was our first opportunity to really get into it. And he's all tender around the bass and he's a pretty aggressive bass player. And so, uh, he's, I, I said, what's wrong with your hand? And he said, Oh, it was a bread knife incident. <laughs> so, and I was like, let's call our band that. And, you know, I never really liked the band name, <laughs> but I, I rarely do like band names, honestly. I mean, missionary, come on. But, um, I, it fit the mentality that I wanted to have, which was to just not think about it, just just do. And that band ended up being the best band I was ever in. I mean, it's hard to gauge because I was in so many different projects over the years. But to me, it was, uh, to some extent, like the pinnacle of my musical career. Um, and you can find our stuff on Spotify, Bread Knife Incident. Um, and, I, you know, I would say nine out of ten of the songs I, I stand around. There's a couple songs that we wrote and recorded as a joke, by the way. There's like a rock song that is really silly. Like the whole song is just a... We were trying to make fun of that kind of music. Anyway, number two. Have you seen the Apple TV Plus series called Pachinko? No, I haven't. I've seen it pop up when I'm on Apple TV Plus, And it looks interesting because uh, it's... It's Asian American, right? Um, Luca says, is there an age or a year span that is too young or too early to start going to couples therapy? End of question. No, absolutely not. Uh, in my early career, I actually uh, treated teenagers who were just boyfriend and girlfriend. They'd only been dating for like a month and um, they came into therapy and I helped them. <laughs> um, 
yeah, this notion that somehow couples therapy is only for old people that have been married for 10 years or something is really quite silly. You could literally, I need to say, I need to stop saying literally soft. Um, you can benefit from couples therapy after three dates, <laughs> you know, even if you just go to one session, right? So there, there's a lot that, you know, there's a lot of benefits to it. So, yeah. Um, and some of the most functional couples I've ever worked with would come in very early, say within the first couple of years, even before there's major problems. Anyway, uh, I mean, think of it like it's an opportunity to have very formalized time to get things off your chest and to understand each other. That should happen at any phase. And to have a therapist there really facilitates that. Ferrix says, does owning pets increase attachment security to humans? End of question. Yeah, absolutely. There's lots of research on this. A lot of well-being uh, um, dimensions are enhanced in general by humans who have pets as opposed to humans who don't. Um, emotional regulation, lower depression rates, lower blood pressure, um, lower triglyceride cholesterol levels associated with heart disease. Um, yeah, people live longer when they have pets. Uh, that one's a little dubious, but uh, but yeah, so many different effects. Now, is that all related to attachment style or attachment security? Not necessarily, right? But I would say in terms of the broad sense, absolutely. I mean, that's why it helps in all those things because when we feel securely attached and taken care of and paid attention to, and not only just emotionally, but physically, you know, the, the, a big reason why pets are so prevalent among uh, certain groups of people in the United States is because we're so touch phobic, even in our own long-term relationships. We're so vulnerability phobic and uh, cats and dogs and other animals, they don't have those insecurities. So usually, and so they'll just come up to us and love us and, or at least they don't appear to have those kinds of insecurities or they're not as ready to have those insecurities. And so we have replaced, which is fine, but at the same time, you know, just recognize that like one of the, for y'all to think about is the next time you're hanging out with your partner, if you have one and you're hanging out with your pets, if you have them and you have this urge to like pick up the cat or um, hang out with the dog. Notice that inside of you, you have an urge to connect with another attachment figure. It's not necessarily the dog or the cat that will be able to meet that need, your partner. So just add that to your knowledge, because if you always direct your attachment um, signaling and, and physical attunement signaling to your animals, you're missing out on the deep connection that you can get with another human, you know, eye to eye contact, fully understanding each other, the full support that you get from your partner. Um, you know, pets are great. And of course, uh, never turn away from, you know, I'm not saying turn away from your pets. I'm just saying you should be able to meet all your needs because our animals can only meet some of those needs. They can meet a lot of them, but only some of them. Uh, adults out of order says, can you have weather related trauma? One very hot summer seemed to have traumatized me. End of question. Absolutely. In the same way I was talking earlier that if you have terror, right? Like you have one uh, uh, really hot summer where you just worry that you're never going to be able to cool off. You, you're worried you're going to um, you know, sweat yourself to death or have, um, or you've lost, or you're worried, will I ever be able to walk, you know, on a, on a stroll outside without worrying I'm going to pass out? Yeah, that could absolutely be traumatizing. Not necessarily, but it could be. All right. One more question. L says, what does your typical week look like? Judging work podcast with Umberto, with Bob and Rebecca and making Patreon deep dives and reaction videos Seems like you do a lot. End of question. Yeah, well, I won't bore everyone with my stupid week, but typical week is, um, it's not really differentiated anymore because 
uh, I'm so much just doing the podcast right now. In the past, it was it was I had a very clear difference between different days in the week. Monday was always with clients. Tuesday was always at the university because that's when we had our meetings and I would sometimes teach that day. Wednesday mornings, I always taught this one class. Uh, Wednesday afternoons would look a certain way. Thursday was often when I started working on the podcast. Friday, I would maybe do interviews and then I would have the weekend to kind of play around with. And that, that went on for years and years, maybe like 10, 15 years it was like that. But since I've scaled back on my clients, quite a bit and I and I'm I'm barely teaching at all like for example this this quarter I'm this term I'm not teaching at all it's all podcasts so there's no difference between a Monday a Thursday and a Saturday there, there's there's no difference all day all days are just 16 hours of available time <laughs> and Stacy too because she doesn't have a, a day job uh, anymore either and so uh, we we you know, sometimes we'll look at each other and be like, what day of the week is it? <laughs> we'll just have no idea because there's no anchor anymore. Um, and of course, the pandemic, you know, made that even more pronounced. And as I record this right now, we're in the, involved in another wave of, um, of COVID. So it, when you don't have Saturday night with friends or that kind of thing, it just every day just becomes the same. So I, I could just tell you about a typical day, which is that I wake up and hang out with the dogs, hang out with Stacy. I usually have a snack, maybe go for a walk. And then I do a lot of email stuff, a lot of internet kind of stuff. There's also little chores you got to do like laundry. And, you know, I do a lot of that in the morning. Sometimes it could be you know, five in the evening before I'm done with all that stuff. Sometimes I'm done at noon or something. And then I start doing things that I am trying to get to, which is, you know, recording episodes or researching episodes, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, mixing episodes, editing episodes, you know, more kind of in-depth stuff. And I'll do that for a while. And then Stacy and I usually have dinner around like five o'clock. We'll maybe watch a show today we watched an episode of obi-wan kenobi which i find to be not great uh, it's interesting but it's no mandalorian i'll put it that way um i mean the second season or no yeah yeah mandalorian was great but and you know the boba fett series was actually pretty bad the first half second half was awesome but anyway so we watched a little, i watched a little bit of that and then uh after that uh we might just relax, Stacy and I, or I just go back into my office and start recording, which is what I did right now. <laughs> you know, it's eight o'clock right now and I'm recording this episode. And so uh, then uh, Stacy goes to bed earlier than I do. And then I might play Age of Empires with Umberto <laughs> late at night, or I'll just play by myself or I'll just watch random YouTube channels. So, th so that's, that's me every day. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, but I I love it uh, I really do like this this I I've carefully engineered my life over the span of thirty years in my adult life of, of a career to have what I have right now which is um, what I have which is what I'm doing <laughs> I'm doing exactly what I want to do I I wouldn't change a thing uh, the only if I could have one wish I would wish that there, there was more hours in the day that I could do this stuff and actually um, get to the things that I really want. There's so many things on the list, you know, um, so many emails, so many deep dives I want to do, so many TV shows that people ask me to watch and react to, that kind of thing. And so I wish there were um, just more time. But, but you know, you can't do everything. And, and when I think about all the things that I do get done, I just have to say like, why do I, why do I get, I think it's part of, it's just a drive that I have. I just, I, I just want to be able to do it all. And uh, I'm just never satisfied. I mean, I'm satisfied, but I'm also never satisfied at the same time. And there's always that next, you know, milestone that I'm trying to cross and, and, uh, but I'm enjoying the, I'm, I enjoy it like right now, you know, I'm sitting here with y'all while you're listening and 
uh, I'm not thinking about, I'm not future tripping. I'm not thinking about the past. I'm right here, right now, talking to you and just enjoying myself. I feel good. I, I, I had a good dinner, had some pagliacci pizza and breadsticks and salad. <laughs> and uh, uh, I, I have a good energy today, hence why I'm still working at 8.30 at night. I love the questions that you're asking. Um, I like to rant about the various things that y'all give me a chance to rant about. I, um, yeah, I, I feel good. There was an imposter trying to, in, you know, trying to imp impose, <laughs> trying to pose as me on various different platforms, YouTube, Discord, other places. And uh, it took a while to get all those accounts taken down, but we finally got the last one that I know of taken down on, on YouTube. And, um, so I'm happy about that. And, uh, that was a lot of stress hanging over my head thinking of, because this person was trying to sell crypto. <laughs> I just find that just to be like, because when I first heard about the imposter, Pete Alley, the discord guardian uh, reached out. She's like, Hey, you know, someone's, someone's acting like you on discord. And uh, she sent me screenshots of their conversation. And it was hilarious because like right away, Ali figured out it was an imposter. The, the guy was using my picture and my name and, uh, and, and apparently was trying to, you know, pass off as me while trying to get people to go to his website that sells crypto. <laughs> I just find that just to be really a sign of the times because if you're going to oppose as someone, you just think you would try to, I don't know, at least troll people. <laughs> like, you know, in the old days, that's why you had imposters is they were just trolling. They were trying to just mess with you. But of course, in 2022, it, it has to, everyone's obsessed with crypto. And I just find the, the whole thing, it's like, okay, fine. <laughs> like crypto, great, you know, gambling. That's all that it is. That's, you know, I have crypto. Like there are things that, uh, uh, it's convenient to have Bitcoin or whatever you call it because of, you know, the conveniences of, of using that sort of currency. But so I'm not saying it's not useful. It is, but in terms of like the whole prospect uh, investment scheme and trying to game the system when you, you just can't, there's uh, certainly there are people who have made money, but they were, they were just lucky. That's all that it is. And, and there's lots of people who've lost a lot of money because they, bought a lot of crypto at the peak uh, that happened recently and they've lost everything. And you know, that that's the nature of gambling. You, you win some, you lose some and stock market, it's all the same. It's fine if you want to do it, but don't, don't tell me, especially if you're trying to pose as me, don't claim to people that somehow you have a surefire way of getting, making them money anyway. But, um, but yeah, so by the way, if you ever get a communication really make sure that it's me because uh, they could be using my picture and my name. So for example, on Discord, my name on Discord is Dr. Kirk. Uh, and so the imposter took the same picture that I use for my profile. And instead of Dr. Dot Kirk, they just said Dr. Kirk, meaning, you know, DR space Kirk. I had DR period Kirk. So it was very slick. It looked exactly the same. And when I saw it, I was like, is that me? And I'm like, no, that's not me. So, but it was funny because Ali, because the imposter was uh, DMing with Ali and Ali was like, um, <laughs> pretty quickly, Ali asks, so what's your favorite memory of our interactions together? <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> the questions seem like one of those questions you see in an action movie, you know, like when a clone walks up to you and you're like, so remember that time when we like, or in Terminator 2 when uh, <clears throat> little John Connor asks the T uh, 1000 or the T whatever the, the liquid metal guy. Um, hey, oh, mom, how's Wolfie? And the imposter mom says, Oh, Wolfie's fine. 
he just, you know, spooked by a squirrel or something. It just seems something what Allie did just seemed totally right out of those movies because it wouldn't have occurred to me to ask a question. And the way he responded was just so indicative of an imposter. He's like, oh, it's I'm, it's, I'm kind of busy or I can't remember what he said, but it was some sort of really obvious answer that he wasn't really me. But it was funny because I was trying to think what answer I would have said if I had... Um, have I said this on the podcast before? So sometimes I'll tell Stacy a story because I know I've told Stacy this. And then I'm, I'm talking on the podcast. I'm like, I know I've said all these words before, but was it to y'all or was it just to Stacy? <laughs> Either way. Anyway. <clears throat> well, that does it for that episode. Everyone out there, please take care of yourself. Invest wisely. Spot the imposters. Flag them and report them because you deserve it. We all deserve it. We really, really do.